This is Random Clock Talk tape number 14 by J.M. Huckabee. Huckabee is a certified master clockmaker residing at J.B. Ranch on the near outskirts of Austin, Texas. The uh, subject matter of this tape will be uh, the working uh, functions of a small battery-operated quartz clock movement. Uh, the uh, compass that you see here that is uh, dancing uh, wildly, that compass is sitting approximately over the motor of this little clock movement, and uh, the motion of the compass hand cannot follow the functions of the motor. Therefore, it appears to be uh, uh, just in uh, uh, random dancing motion. As we look into this uh, uh, subject matter, let me speak to some of the things that we will be seeing. Uh, first, this uh, little uh, movement that I have here is not an item that uh, we would normally be repairing in our uh, shop because of its uh, uh, low cost and uh, the ease of replacing one. This uh, movement uh, costs less money than uh, a good lunch and meal in the local cafeteria. So we can see that it doesn't uh, warrant repair. However, I'm going uh, into the mechanism of this to show the technology uh, in uh, general terms of what is in uh, a quartz movement and some of the things that uh, you can expect to find in uh, the workings. And this uh, may help a workman that might uh, uh, desire to get into uh, uh, quartz watches because uh, this is larger. It has uh, some of the uh, uh, principles that's found in quartz watches and uh, uh, it will help the thought process uh, to the beginner. Let's uh, look on to the back of the movement. We find here is a slide switch that says uh, start and stop. Now that slide switch does not turn the battery on and off, but turns the impulse to the motor, to the stepping motor. It's turned on and off by that switch. That permits us to preset to a particular time and synchronize to the second with the standard that uh, uh, we're using to uh, uh, set the movement uh, going. The uh, knob over on this side uh, is the set knob that uh, rotates the uh, uh, hands. And if we take a look in this movement, we'll find that it is not large at all. Uh, this uh, uh, steel scale, we can see it's uh, about two and an eighth inches, uh, the same on both uh, axes. And it is about uh, five eighths of an inch deep. It's a rather small, very nice, uh, very accurate uh, timekeeper. Now, as we work with this movement, we have the same problem that uh, the watchmaker has with his eye loop. Most everything is out of focus except the particular item that uh, we're looking at. So we'll find that uh, it requires lots of tumbling, uh, lots of uh, careful uh, looking because that we cannot uh, uh, see in clear focus all the features at any one time uh, across the the plate of the move or the cover of the movement here this says uh, quartz uh, up in this region it has the name of a Japanese manufacturer the battery a double a cells as general purpose by uh, Rayovac and if we look carefully let me get this in uh, uh, position, be sure that uh, we're running. 
and look right in this region. This uh, case is a frosty gray uh, plastic case, and if you look inside, right below this pencil point, you can see motion there at one second intervals. This is the first reduction uh, gear away from the motor. The motor is right in this region. The motor makes one revolution in two seconds. That is, there is an impulse each second and the motor makes one half turn uh, per second. So in two seconds it makes a revolution. Then the gear train reduces that. We find we can take a look here. We can see the uh, the wheel moving there. And then look in this region right here, right below this pivot. You can see through this frosty gray area. You can see a region here, and that is the that is the center shaft of the clock movement. The movement has a triaxial shaft. Uh, shaft assembly. It has the second sweep second hand, the minute hand, and the hour hand. And the pivot that is at this point carries the second hand. If we look a little further, we can see in this region, no, I'm in the wrong place, right here, we can see in this region a uh, continuation of the uh, gear train of reduction uh, gears that ultimately winds up at the minute hand and then the hour hand. Now, from time to time, I'll have problems pointing out these things because we're looking with uh, an eye loop on the camera, a relatively low powered eye loop between the lens of the camera and this point right here, I am four and a half inches away. Now this says that uh, I cannot get in with an eye loop to readily see the things that I'm speaking to. Also, the camera is opposite to me, facing down. So what I what you see on the camera is opposite to my uh, uh, motion here. So it's a little cumbersome to handle, but we'll point the things out and uh, uh, carry you through the uh, the operation of this movement. From time to time, we will have to pause and, and change how we support uh, the individual pieces uh, that is such that we can keep them in focus, and uh, that uh, shouldn't present a particular problem. This says made in Japan right here, or simply says the words uh, Japan. The uh, manufacturer's name, which I'm at a loss to be able to pronounce, is uh, right in this uh, uh, region here. All right, let's uh, turn over and look at some features on the front side. It is single hole mounting. The total length of this shaft here is just over five eighths of an inch. Uh, we have um, uh, provisions here for mounting the minute hand, uh, the hour hand, and the second hand. We can see the shaft right in the uh, uh, hole through here. Let's uh, look at this as to how that we disassemble it. Looking in the edge, we find a self-tab right in this region, right here. This is a self-tab, and that locks the rear cover on the movement assembly. On the opposite side, we have a similar self tab. Now, if we lift up this tab on both sides at the same time, we can lift the uh, uh, rear cover off. And let's do that. The suitable tool for that is the tip end of the wrench pocket knife and uh, I've lifted this cover ever so slightly here, and we'll turn to the other side 
and do likewise. We slipped underneath the, the tab, and I didn't intend for it to jump off that uh, 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 quickly, but uh, here we have the movement open. Now I would like to set this movement aside uh, for the time being and uh, discuss a little of the features that we have in the rear side of this cover. Here's the, the movement with the cover lifted off. Let's see if we can find a, a place to bring this into uh, focus. And if we look in this, right here is the rotor of the motor. And the first reduction, the second reduction, and then this is the second hand shaft. We continue on with another reduction, then down toward the uh, dial side and uh, uh, wind up at the hands. Now let's, uh, let's look in the rear cover. This uh, uh, cover, this is a masterpiece of engineering in its own, uh, uh, own right. We see numerous bosses on the cover here and there. And each one of these uh, uh, features locks up and secures certain pieces in the assembly. If we look here, we find that this appears to be a little funnel. Indeed it is. It's a, it's a funnel shaped uh, uh, hole that uh, is a little more than a tenth of an inch across. And here is another. And here is another. These are pivot holes. These are holes for the pivots of the uh, uh, pieces that we looked at uh, a few moments early. Now these funnels wind up with a very smooth self-bearing blind hole. That hole does not pass through the cover. That hole does not pass through uh, to the outside. So this functions, there's several real nice features about this. Number one, it has the function that we have in a fine jeweled watch where that we have one jewel that holds the pivot in position radially. And then we have an end stone or a capstone that controls the end play. We get both of those functions in each one of these uh, uh, pivot holes. In addition to that, these are funnel shaped, so when we go to assemble the movement, it's as simple as placing the pieces, getting the pieces in place in the movement, drop this on, and snap it in place. Those funnels automatically align the uh, uh, the pivots, and that is the clockmaker's dream come true in uh, uh, getting those wheels lined up and in place. This is made for automated manufacturing, where this is picked by a pick-and-place robot. It's picked up, placed on top, snapped down, and all the wheels are in place. Now let's look a at another item here. We'll move the, I'm using the bench block, a large bench block as a movement holder. That's so that the uh, uh, center shaft can pass through here so that I can lay this flat. Let's set the uh, bench block aside and uh, look a little further. We talked about the rotor, the motor rotor. And uh, let's see if we can get this in, in hand and uh, take a look here. Uh, you can see by the size of my hand, uh, 
the relative size of the rotor. This uh, rotor has a pinion. I believe I'll use a pencil as a pointer here to uh, get away from the magnetism that's in it. There is a pinion on the end here, the pivot. This is a little cage about the uh, uh, rotor, pivot on the other end, and uh, in the center is a little donut of a rare earth magnet. That uh, uh, magnet is uh, somewhat like a ceramic uh, material and uh, oft times called ceramic uh, magnets. And the magnet is magnetized and let's find our way in focus here. The magnet is magnetized on a crosswise uh, axis here. We'll say north on one side and then south on the opposite side. The poles are crosswise uh, in this uh, a magnet. That is the rotor, the entire rotor, that uh, is in this uh, uh, movement. I have to constantly uh, seek for a place that I'm in uh, focus to be able to uh, see that. Now, let's uh, go a step further and begin to remove some of these uh, uh, wheels of the gear train. The rotor sits right in here. The next wheel in the train is this one with the blue dot on it. I don't know if that dot will show up um, uh, blue on the TV camera or not. We're looking at the second wheel, if we call the uh, motor the first wheel. Incidentally, notice that uh, this uh, uh, tweezer is not non-magnetic the rotor sticks to it. What that does, that spoils your tweezer for other use. The tweezer will have to be demagnetized before we use it for some other uh, purpose. Let's go a little further. The third wheel in our train is here. This is the uh, uh, third wheel of the train, and that is the second hand shaft the second hand shaft very very nicely uh, highly polished shaft with the um, uh, plastic uh, wheel and the plastic pinion <clears throat> these uh, wheels appear to be made of, uh, of nylon now let's look at what we left in the in the case when we picked that up Right here, right here is a little friction spring, a little very soft little uh, friction spring. And the purpose of that is to provide just enough friction to keep the backlash out of the second hand that goes on the uh, uh, shaft like this. There is a top and a bottom to that uh, little spring, so when we look at it, we uh, keep top side, top side. All right. Continuing further, the wheel which we lifted out a few moments ago, it continues on, goes below this plate. Now, this is a triple plate uh, movement. There is uh, uh, what would be the equivalency of what we commonly call three plates or a triple plate uh, movement. This uh, wheel, the red dot one, carries the, the uh, motion down below and we ultimately wind up at the hands. Now let's begin to identify some of the other uh, uh, features here. <coughs> See if we can get our light reflection so that we can highlight the item at uh, hand, the battery. Uh, it's a single cell, it's not a battery of cells, it's one and a half volts, double A cell. 
Uh, this is the uh, negative end of the battery. That is the the shell end of the battery. This is the positive end, which has the, the small central tip on it. It's important that the battery go in in the proper polarity. It is uh, uh, held in with uh, a spring clip, and we may have a little problem getting this in and out with the cover off because the clips that support the battery are held in place by the rear cover. So we have to be careful when we lift the battery out after the rear cover is removed. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about the uh, motor. Talk about the stepper motor. Here is the motor coil. That's one of the largest pieces that's in the um, uh, motor mechanism, or the largest piece in, piece in the uh, uh, largest single piece in the entire movement. That coil is wound with a very very small wire. Two leads, the start and the ending lead, come out in this region. They come out just as uh, uh, loose wires, and they're soldered to a printed circuit board which is right under here. Now those wires are very small, very delicate, easily broken. If we gouge this uh, coil or rake it on something here, we would permanently damage the coil. The resistance on that coil is about 900 ohms. If you measure this with an ohm meter, uh, an ordinary uh, ohm meter that uh, is used for any electrical or electronic testing can uh, be used to measure that coil. It's about uh, 900 um, uh, ohms. As we look at the coil, we have within it the pole piece of the coil. If we look here, here is the cavity that the motor rotor rotates in, bearing in the bottom. And uh, this bright piece here is the coil uh, core. It's the magnetic core. This is a paramagnetic uh, material of high permeability. And the coil with a pulse produces a north pole at one end and a south pole at the other end. Uh, this, this loop, it's like a hairpin loop, and we'll disassemble it a little later. This loop passes around here, so if we looked, if this is north end uh, of the motor pole, then the one over here, uh, which we, the pencil is pointing to, would be the south end, be north and south. And if the polarity, if the electrical polarity of the coil is reversed, then the magnetic polarity is reversed. And we find in operation that that is the, the circumstance. This coil receives an impulse in which, uh, let's say for instance, this is North Pole, this is South Pole. The next impulse, then this polarity will be reversed, and the next is reversed again, etc. Now let's begin to lift out some of these pieces, <clears throat> see what's uh, in the uh, uh, depth below. get where we can look at this. I am, I'm working opposite from the camera. I cannot get an eye loop in uh, position. So what I have to do is look on a television screen monitor to see what the camera sees. And I look at the, the uh, uh, television screen to uh, pick these pieces out. And uh, I have a little trouble because the camera's on one side, I'm on the other. What I'm doing appears to be uh, backwards in my uh, uh, handling of these things. Let's see if I can lift this out. We're lifting out. And uh, pull out some more. 
and things seem to be uh, pretty much tangled up here about the time we lift this out. But it's really not that, uh, it's really not that way at all. Let's uh, do this. We'll come down here and we'll pull this lead off of the printed circuit board like that. And we'll take the second lead and we'll pull it off of the printed circuit board. Now let's see what uh, this lead looks like. <clears throat> Tip end of it here is the spring that holds the battery in place. It finds its way uh, finds its way round through the passages and inside the case and we come over to this little tab right here. That's the start and stop switch. When we slide the start and stop switch we flex this and we touch down or don't touch down on the printed circuit board with this little uh, uh, shoe on the end and that gives us the start stop function on the, the movement. If we turn here, let's look at a little clevis. Find our way into the picture with this little uh, clevis right here. Right here. All right, we see the, the tip ends are turned under and the two are very, two ta tangs are close to each other there is a v-shaped entry here and this is latched on to the printed circuit board much as if I just take this and push it on to um, uh, astride my tweezer here that's how that we latch to the printed circuit board in the pick-in-place robot that assembles this, this is picked up, dropped in place, and then the printed circuit board is pressed right in here. That makes the uh, that makes the connection. We find the uh, uh, other lead of the battery. This is the positive lead of the battery. Is the same thing, and I deformed this one tab just a, a little bit when. Uh, when uh, I pulled it off the PC board so we can straighten it up like that and, and we'd be ready to go back. This is held in place in the movement by some uh, dowel pins that's in these two holes right here and the tips of those dowel pins are sharpened much as uh, a taper pin that we use in um, uh, clock movement. So this gets just dropped into place, gets dropped into place, and some of the features of the other uh, plastic parts then become hold down uh, to hold these down and they're locked solidly in place. Look a little further. See what we can do with, with this. Here is the center plate. This is the what would be the, the central plate of the three plate uh, system. We find the pivot holes, pivot hole, pivot hole, pivot holes. These are all in, uh, in place here. Now let's uh, drop our uh, motor rotor in and see what we have there. The rotor of the motor sits, and that magnetic tweezer doesn't work out so well there. Maybe I can put this in with my fingers here. But now there is the motor rotor in place, standing on its uh, bearing. And uh, this rotor turns one half turn each time that the uh, motor coil is energized. It makes one half turn. It turns in the opposite direction. It actually rotates in, in uh, this direction. 
These, uh, the entryway to these holes is uh, funnel shaped, so it's uh, very easy assembled. <clears throat> now we're getting down to, to the uh, uh, motor coil. Let's look at the motor coil, and here's the pole piece for the motor coil. Let's look at this pole piece very careful. Uh, the shape of this uh, looks uh, uh, simple, just in appearance, but there is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, effort gone into the design of this uh, uh, motor pole. <clears throat> Let's see if we can see this little cutout right here. Take a, a mental picture of that uh, cut corner and let me turn it over and let's look at the other corner. We see this corner looks different. It's longer, has a square edge in it. This one is um, uh, shorter and a slight radius in there. That is used to identify top and bottom to this particular piece. There is a top bottom to the piece and it must be assembled correctly and in the case in the front sector of the case, section of the case, there are some features that fits into this that uh, inhibits mounting it upside down. It can only go in one way. Now let's notice here. The motor rotor rotates in this. And if you look pretty well, you see that that is not round. That opening is not round. But if we look at this projection, this projection, this projection, and that projection, they represent the regions that almost touch the motor rotor. And the function of this is preferential magnetic paths from these projections relative to other areas of this um, uh, pole piece. And the result is that if we receive an electrical impulse to the coil, just prior to the receipt of that uh, electrical impulse, that rotor is detented or detained in a particular position and if we had an imaginary line on the rotor, it would be across, let's say, from that tip to this tip. We receive an electrical impulse, and because of the preferential positions, magnetic positions, and clearances here, and the polarity of the impulse, the rotor immediately turns one half turn and it turns counterclockwise. And because of these preferential uh, uh, magnetic paths, it will turn counterclockwise and counterclockwise only. The subsequent pulse or the next pulse is of the opposite polarity. Being of the opposite polarity electrically, then it is magnetically of the opposite polarity, the rotor turns another half turn. And the polarity of the pulses to the coil alternate. Consequently, the magnetic polarity alternates and the rotor turns counterclockwise a half turn on each pulse. And this continues on and on. Look at the coil. Now, possibly, right in this region, you can see the wire. It's a little kind of uh, pinkish or reddish colored wire in that uh, area. There's two of these that uh, uh, come out from uh, uh, the coil. They pass over here and are soldered to the printed circuit board here and here. The printed circuit board has very, very few components on it. 
we see this pretty black dot here. This is an electronic module that handles many functions. The quartz crystal. This is the quartz crystal right here. That quartz crystal, if it receives an electrical impulse, it responds and gives back an alternate polarity impulse. And then it's pulsed again and it returns the pulse in alternate polarity. And this continues on and on as long as we're under power. Called a crystal oscillator. The frequency, the signal magnitude was so low on this that I was unable or unsuccessful in placing a, a counter on this and counting the frequency. But the frequency of that crystal might be any one of many frequencies. Of course, the electronic module has to be compatible to the uh, design frequency. I suspect, I suspect the oscillatory rate of this is something over 4 megahertz, that is over 4 million cycles per second. This little capacitor here, uh, soldered in at these two points, is a tuning capacitor for the crystal. Uh, many of our watches, quartz clocks and whatnot, has this capacitor uh, as an adjustable unit so that we have a fast, slow regulator on it. If these two pieces are aptly chosen pairs, then we don't need the regulator. So this serves as the crystal oscillator to excite the crystal. The second thing that it serves as is a divider circuit to divide that frequency, if this be 4 megahertz, uh, 4 plus megahertz, uh, it serves as a frequency divider that divides that frequency down, 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 down. Uh, electronically, electronically, in uh, a module of this type, or in any electronics, it is very difficult to divide by three or five or seven or something of that nature, but it is extremely easy to divide by two. And generally speaking, and I presume that to be uh, true here, the frequency that we began with is some value that when divided by two, some specific number of times, we come out to one impulse per second. One common frequency that is used in uh, uh, battery-operated uh, quartz clocks is the frequency that I mentioned that I suspect that this is 4 megahertz. The frequency that is used that's around 4 megahertz is 4,194,304. That is 4194304 cycles per second. If that frequency is divided by 2 22 times, we will arrive at 1 pulse per second precisely. So this module, this electronic module, must sustain the oscillation of the crystal and then subdivide that frequency by 22 times, if this be the uh, uh, 4 plus megahertz crystal, bring it down to an impulse per second. Then it must do the second thing it must provide that impulse to the motor coil of a given polarity. The next pulse must be of reverse polarity. The next pulse reversed again, and we alternate on and on.
So that's the function of the module. Some, uh, uh, some uh, clocks, watches, use a frequency of 32,768. 32,768 cycles per second. If that frequency crystal is used, then it must be divided by two in the module 16 times to produce one cycle per second. So we see that uh, a variety of crystal frequencies could be used, but that it must be compatible, must be compatible to the module that we have here. Now, this little printed circuit board, things look very simple here. It has the electronic module on it, the coil terminals, the capacitor terminals, uh, the crystal terminals, and here and here, or the battery terminals. The battery terminals, again, this little clip is snapped down onto the edge of the printed circuit board, locked in place, and that gives us the um, uh, battery terminals. So that in uh, uh, we might say just in block diagram form or in general terms is all there is in this uh, uh, electronic uh, unit. It's a very sophisticated piece of electronics. But when we look at it uh, as this, as a component, uh, it's uh, pretty much the acme of simplicity. The most delicate thing here is the coil. If I'm not careful, if I squeeze that wire and break one of those leads there, then this movement is caboose. We know it was good when we tore it down because the movement was running. Let's look at the um, uh, motor core. Big motors, this would be called motor stator. We can put this in this way. We can assemble it this way. We can assemble it this way. And we can assemble it this way. Now, three of those ways are wrong. There's only one of those ways that is workable. Let's look into this case see if we can find our uh, key to assembly. Let's see if we can drop in this uh, back in the camera here. When you're looking at this indirectly, it's not easy to find uh, the way in there. All right. We said the motor rotor sits in this pocket. Sits right in this pocket. That says that this must yoke that pocket. So it either goes that way or this way. Now we can't make a mistake when we go over these little sharp dart like pins here. Remember that this is built for auto automated manufacturing where this is a drop in place type of thing. Like that. Now I cannot seat this down because the features on this end here says no. That's wrong. So let's turn it over. Now you see this is a drop-in place. The features here dictate where it goes. 
drops in very, very easy. Might chase a side little issue here. Today is July the 4th, 1988. It's uh, about 6.15 in the afternoon. Here on the JB Ranch, we've had a good day today commemorating the independence of the United States. The uh, freedom of uh, a nation is a priceless, is a priceless thing that uh, we take for granted that many people of the world have to give their lives and maybe never have. We fly a couple of flags on the ranch here every day of the world. Texas flag, U.S. flag on the uh, uh, flagpole. Uh, of course, uh, rural people on a, a ranch every day is a work day. And uh, this afternoon we paused a little while to reflect on the freedoms that we have in this uh, uh, nation and we looked at the flag and we expressed our prayer of thanks for the uh, freedoms and the blessings that we have. And as I thought on these things, I find that freedom is very precious in, uh, in uh, my life. I grew up as a young man and uh, uh, was in the World War II, also in the uh, Korean War as a soldier in the U.S. Army. And uh, the little high school that I attended only had about nine boys in the, uh, nine young men in the high school graduation class, of which five of them were killed in those two wars. That makes the, the price of freedom ever in my mind and how important it is to us as a people. We also think about our blessings about the time I started to slow down and in the afternoon from the work and uh, set this talk in place. We had an electric power failure here on the ranch. And that's just about uh, disastrous to a place like this. We've been pumping water all day long. The temperature here today, mid-afternoon, was 100 degrees. We pump 10 or 15,000 gallons of water a day in that uh, type of weather to uh, uh, keep a green fire break around the house here. Power failure, the water stopped, the air conditioner stopped, the uh, uh, ice maker uh, gave up, we couldn't cook our supper. Uh, all these things go on, the air conditioning gave up. It's, it's hot here in the shop now at 6.15, the power come back on a little while ago. But when we think of this, we should pause and be thankful to our Creator for the blessings that He gives us in both freedom and material blessings and spiritual blessings in every day of our life. Let's look down inside of this. Here is the pipe that carries the hour hand. <clears throat> right here, oh, I'm on the opposite side of the camera. Uh, right here is a little self tab in this wheel. There's three of them there, three of these little tabs, and they provide friction against this bearing to take the backlash or to keep the backlash caught up in one direction in the hour hand. For assembly, we just drop that in place. Here is the shaft, the pipe that carries the minute hand. And here is a beautiful little device here. 
This wheel is buttoned in place there. It's a little groove in that pipe, and it just buttons right onto that wheel like that. And that provides the friction that permits us to set the, uh, set the hands. That's the friction clutch that drops in there. Let's uh, look at our uh, battery leads. This battery lead drops in there. We drop on these little pointed pins, these little dowels there, and uh, that is in place. Let's try the positive battery lead. And we have to back off here just a little bit. This should have gone in first. This is a drop-in lead. Now you see, with the drop-in assembly, we have our battery leads. Let's go back and drop this one in, see if we may not have the order of assembly correct here. Now look here. Look right there. You see the little clevis clip? And we'll go a little further and we see that one. That printed circuit board will be pressed in between these clips, edge down, and automatically make connection in that. And that hooks the battery up to the printed circuit board. This is the start-stop switch tab. The end of that touches down on the printed circuit board. And uh, there is a, a little projection from the slide button on the rear cover that operates that. Now, let's uh, drop in the center plate. See if I can get into the picture again. There's the center plate dropped in place. And when we drop that in, its projections lock in the positive battery lead. The uh, negative battery lead at this point is not um, uh, not locked into uh, uh, place. Let me set this aside on my uh, bench block. Let's look at this. How do we know? which way this this goes. Well, if we try this first, we can intuitively discover that that's wrong because we could not place the motor rotor in between the two pole pieces. So that's intuitively wrong. says that it must go this way. Now we have the space we have the space that the motor rotor can insert here but we may be upside down. Let's look at the uh, features on the end and uh, look in this and I believe that we're correct. Let's give it a try and see. If we are correct, if we are correct there, this will drop in and seat down there. And yes, we are. This post and this cutout here gives us that feature. So we know we're correct there. Okay that in here. It's about 6.20 in the afternoon here on the, on the ranch. The air conditioning hasn't recovered from that power failure earlier in the day today, and it is indeed hot here in this uh, uh, shop. But uh, 
Things will be caught up and be all right uh, by morning. Now, how do we latch the uh, printed circuit board in place? We just press down here, just hard enough to latch that in place. And there we are. That uh, latches the uh, uh, PC board in place, hooks up the electrical leads. We've got the motor assembled. And uh, let's place the battery in, in place. Springs on the negative end, so we head in positive end first. And uh, there we are. What do we have here? See that compass going? Now, now what do we conclude from that? We conclude that the battery circuit, the electronics, the crystal, the coil, all of this, everything in the electrical circuit is functional. There is not, there is not a technical problem in this. If this movement does not run now, it's somewhere other than in the crystal, the coil, the electronic circuit, the battery, uh, whatnot. So that is a quick test that you can place on one of these to see uh, what do we have. Let's drop this on here. And uh, my compass pointer was dragging on, on uh, the dial there. Uh, the needle cannot distinctly follow the magnetics here, but the fact that it is in motion tells us that the magnetics is in operation. Let's uh, pause for me to pick up some tools, and uh, we will, uh, the pointer's hung up there again, I could do well to have a new compass. I'll pick up some tools. We'll return to the camera here uh, shortly, and we'll assemble the gear train and put this back together. We pause for a few moments to pick up a tool, and uh, while I uh, was out, got a sip of cool soda pop and a couple of hot dogs, which is the uh, traditional Fourth of July meal in the Huckabee family, and. Uh, back to continue with the uh, movement. We can see that the uh, uh, electronics and the magnetic circuit of this uh, uh, clock is uh, functioning. Now it's not necessary for this uh, pointer to go round and round. The fact that we can see it pulsing tells us that it's going and it would depend on uh, the location of the compass relative to the uh, uh, magnet poles as to uh, really what its uh, activity is. Let's, uh, let's see if the, let's test the, the rotor. We've determined that the uh, pole pieces and, and uh, the electronics and whatnot is going. Let's uh, examine this uh, rotor. I'm having trouble with this uh, uh, a screwdriver because it's not of the non-magnetic type, but let's just stick this rotor in place and ask the question, is it working or not? Observe the rotor very carefully and you can probably see a little tremor in it from time to time. See that? It is not rotating, it's just shaking. Now this tells us that the electrical, magnetic, electronic circuit is, is going okay. 
But we don't know at this moment if the rotor is in good shape and, and uh, if it will run or not. Now let me get this into a little better focus. Uh, bear with me a moment to uh, get some things in, in view here. We'll touch the camera focus ever so slightly. Possibly this is it. I have here in my hand a runner for my English turns, for an old English watchmaker's turns. It's a double-ended uh, runner, cup centers on it, and uh, they're not too different from what we might find in a, a watchmaker's staking tool set. So if you have a watchmaker's stake, staking tool, use that. Uh, if you have a lathe, you can take a little piece of rod or something and turn a cup center and use that. Now wa watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to place a substitute pivot on this rotor. And I have to be very careful to get the end play right, to get the uprighting of it uh, correct. Let me try again. Not being able to get the eye loop in here, not being able to get under this, this camera, this is uh, a little difficult uh, task to see. Particularly when your eyes are 68 years old. How about that? Well, I'm off center there again. There we go. How about that? Now what this tells us is that we know that we have a good rotor, we know that we have the good electrical circuit, and all of these things. What we're doing is dividing the technology in some clear-cut lines. We're saying, uh, all right, if you have problem, do you have battery problem, do you have uh, wiring problem, do you have coil problem, do you have uh, uh, electronics rotor problem, uh, these types of things. I did not uh, show you the measurement, but uh, we can touch an ohmmeter onto these coil leads and measure the resistance of that coil. And uh, it's a little less than a thousand ohms. And if the ohmmeter got uh, some figure that was up tens of thousands of ohms, we would know we had a problem. If we got something that was down uh, a few ohms or a few hundred ohms, we would know that we have a problem. The exact value is not as important as that uh, it is within the uh, general area of where it should be. And uh, now as we continue, if we have uh, any malfunction, it will be in the mechanical circuit of the um, uh, gear train. All right, let's uh, take the center uh, uh, shaft, which is the which carries the second hand. We have the little friction spring on it. It's in the proper place. I'm holding it so that can't get away. There we go, we drop that in place. This is on the bearing in the far end. Considerable slack here. But remember the funnel shaped bearings and the uh, blind hole sets the end play correct and sets that in location so we don't have a, uh, a problem in uh, uh, that. The uh, uh, wheel here, let's look at this one. Right there. No pivot. No pivot on that wheel. There's a hole. There's a pivot here. Down below down below in this, there is a stationary pin 
that serves as that pivot that goes right there. Friends, I've just pulled off a stunt here that uh, uh, we all know better than, than to do. See this wheel here? See that one? Guess where that goes? Guess where that goes? Well, <clears throat> that goes right in the bottom under all this pile that we put together. How about that? So what do you do in that case? Well, it's not all that big a deal. We just take it apart. Look at it again. Put it down inside. Let's uh, see if we can get this out a little more intact than we did the previous time. drop it and we'll go back together this uh, this dial works doesn't look uh, too different from uh, what it does in uh, conventional uh, clocks get these in they drop in this drops in in <clears throat> this wheel here which we left out. She has no pivot in it. We look down in here, we don't find any pivot down there either. Get under the camera again. Look right in this pocket right here. No pivot. No pivot. Now, when we drop that wheel into that pocket, there's no pivot there. The pivot for that um, uh, the pivot for that wheel is on the back side of this center plate, and that pocket holds that wheel in place so that when we go into the assembly, that we're okay. All right. Let's uh, get our minute hand shaft in place and uh, 
that. I believe we've got these things going in the in the proper order uh, this time. We take our motor. We're going to drop the electronics board. the motor in place. Remember that we latch this down by pressing down there. That hooks the leads up. <clears throat> and let's see how we're doing now. And are we running? Okay, now we're back where we started, or back where we back, got back set, all right? Our friction spring, it goes in like that. Second hand shaft, and this is our gear train. Trying to find the focus here. heads for our, our uh, motion works. Let's touch this focus a little. There we are. And place the rotor I'm afraid I'm going to have to get me an eye loop to find a place for that one. I'm going to have to get an eye loop to find the place. Bear with me. Sorry, I just couldn't see down in that hole to uh, get that one in place. There we are. This movement's trying to run right now, as we can see. And uh, let's look at the cover. Look at the cover. Here's the projection of the start-stop switch, this V here, that sits over this tab. This tab is pushed against the printed circuit board to stop the impulse for synchronization and setting. Now, see what we have to do to get this together. This is a, a straight down, straight down latch in place. Did you ever assemble a movement that got the pivots in place that easy. We ask the question, is it running? 
Well, let's see if it is. I'll show you where to look. Motor rotor is right about there. You may not be able to see it. I placed a blue dot on that wheel right there. Can you see it moving? See it? That movement is running. It's all together. And uh, you've never had, until you tear one of these things down, you've never had a, an experience that is that inexpensive in such a high technology. That is a, a beautiful little movement. The engineering in that is just absolutely superb. It is a fabulous timekeeper. And uh, I don't know any uh, reason, I don't know any reason at all that we should attempt to repair these, except uh, I believe that every workman should go into one of these and look at it purely from an educational standpoint. Purely to know and to see, to see and to know the things that are in the marketplace in this period of time. That is a technological advancement that, uh, uh, well, let's just think about uh, John Harrison when he was trying to establish uh, longitude at sea. And he worked for years and years and years and years to achieve a degree of accuracy that has very little, if any, margin over what's in this little movement here. And this little movement can be purchased today, again, for less money than a lunch and meal in a downtown cafeteria. Under $5 in, in today's market, and when these are bought in quantity, even substantially uh, under that level. Glad to have you with me today. I'm J.M. Huckabee, certified master clockmaker. I'm certified by the American Watchmakers Institute. I'm a fellow of the British Horological Institute. We're uh, located on the J.B. Ranch, just on the north outskirts of Austin, Texas. Uh, I am uh, retired and doing these things, making these tapes, to pass along some of the skills and information that I've learned over many, many years, to pass this along to uh, uh, younger men that have a similar interest in clockmaking. Thank you for being